Yeah, and as we all know, money doesn't truly make you happy. And there's how many multimillionaires, how many billionaires have gotten to the point where they've they've given up work and 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 almost committing suicide <laughs> within a year because they're so bored or or they've made that final sale and then they sit there and then they think, well, what else is there? What else is there to do now? Or they try to then regain their health that they've lost because they've worked, you know, hundred hour weeks and flown all over the the world and. You know, pro- probably got a divorce or two in there somewhere, and and children, and and all of a sudden they finish and they think, well, what have I actually achieved? Yes, I've been in this wonderful position and ha- weren't all this money, but am I healthy? Money doesn't make you happy, Neil says, and he also mentions health. You know, are they healthy? And he doesn't just mean physically health; he means mental health, and. There's a theme in this interview with Neil, because although we hear his journey, and of course, you know, we're all chasing money at the end of the day. There probably isn't anybody alive that doesn't need money to survive. And therefore, it is one of these primary objectives, but that gets a stage where it, it really just becomes obscene. And also, it's to the detriment of somebody's health. You know, whether it's individuals working in organisations where people are chasing the money, or whether it's people in public services where there isn't enough money to serve them in the in these organisations and to serve the public. So we we've pretty much got everything covered in this interview that you're about to listen to. Neil's a fascinating guy. He has a great journey that he's on and the next chapter of what he's going to be doing sounds really, really interesting and hopefully will be of interest to some of you who are listening and maybe you can help him and introduce him to some people that need his support and assistance. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Neil. How are you today? I'm really well, thank you, Michael. How about yourself? Yeah, I'm absolutely brilliant. It's a nice sunny day out there, so that always puts me in a good mood, as as it does most people. Um <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. And um, I always kick off with the same question. My listeners probably get fed up of me saying that as well. Um, so you're going to get started, if you wouldn't mind, and tell us a little bit about your personal life to start with. So where were you born? Have you moved around a bit about your education? You know, perhaps where you now live? Um, about your family, but you don't have to, you know, share all the details about your family. That that's private as well. Um, just so we get a sense of um, where you've started and and how life started for you, Neil. Yes, ab- absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Um, right then, let's let's go all the way back to the start. Then I suppose. So yeah. I was. Yeah, yeah. I, I was born in East Birmingham. It was um, opposite um, the the hospital in my nan's uh, front room upstairs. Sorry, the front bedroom uh, used to be my granddad's room later on, and that's where I was born. Wow. So um, yeah, I, I quite like the fact I had a home birth. I don't know if it did me any good or not. Uh, <laughs> and there was a bit of drama because the yeah, the uh, the family dog was going ballistic, and it was back in the days when the midwives believed that the the animals uh, had as much right to sort of meet the baby as well. So much to my mother's disgust, the dog was let upstairs wow. and was licking me all over but apparently he was my best friend he would never leave my side and oh it was my little my guardian God. <laughs> i've never heard so, that ever before that's incredible yeah it just wouldn't happen these days would it with the sterile nature of everything but so yeah the, the midwife was absolutely insistent uh, that the dog would only accept him uh, accept me rather if it was allowed to come in and yeah, it all worked wonderfully um and it was back in the days when they would put the push chair outside the front door and the dog would just sit there guarding you uh, so the baby could get some fresh air so um 
yeah, so, so, so life started sort of sort of around there. Um, mm. And then my parents uh, got a house in uh, Small Heath in Birmingham, and we lived there until I was probably around about 10 years old. But my parents divorced when I was around about seven years old. So it's very common these days, I suppose. But uh, what am I going back 40-odd years ago? It was unusual. Um mm. Um, because my mum actually left the household. Right. Um, but, yeah, there's a whole stuff in behind that. And later on in life, I found out that, um, as I call him, the biological father uh, wasn't quite the man I would want to be if I grew up. But I yes. won't say too much about that. But, yes, we moved to Small Heath. I went to St. Benedict's Junior and Infant School, um, really enjoyed school, always a, a sort of lively character. And then from there went into Washwood Heath Comprehensive, um, which was a fantastic school. I was there for three years, but then things changed in the family again, and and, and I was living over in in Hall Green at the time, right. and biological father who was still living with had remarried, and they were moving up to Scotland, and oh. we had the, the choice to either sort of stay down here with my, my mom, uh, who'd also remarried to to uh, a gentleman her class as my father. He's been an absolute little rock all the way through from sort of 10 years old um, and he's been better than most biological fathers from what yeah. I can gather yeah and um, yeah so everything was sort of uplifted went from an inner city sort of really vibrant school multicultural to uh, causal comprehensive <laughs> which is a ah, real school. yes <laughs> yeah. I used to I work in my... causal so oh yeah so you know it yeah yeah it, I do it, know um... it yeah it's an interesting place with all the pubs. It's great for pub crawls if you're into that sort of oh, thing. Oh, God, no, I'm not. But, yeah, I didn't even notice that <laughs> when I worked there. <laughs> well, I'm glad I didn't at those early ages. But, um, yeah, it was usually quite well known for having so many pubs in in a mile or something. Um, so, so yes, as I say, Kozel, we used to get picked up by a coach because I lived in a small village called Kerdworth, which was absolutely fantastic. Mm. Um, for about 16 of us around about the same sort of age because it was um, a, a, a small village, really tiny village. The, the parents were much more relaxed about you being out and about. So, you know, we'd just leave the house and disappear for the whole day or whatever at the weekends and come back. But it was a, a really nice sort of... Um, nice area to grow up in and it was completely different to sort of in a city yes. um at the school i i hated to start with because i went from this inner city very modern thinking um in fact we had a couple of teachers that used to look like eddie shoestring gosh i'm showing my age now then Do you i remember know that? the name but i can't picture him <laughs> It was a detective program, and two of them looked like him, and they were real sex symbols at the time. And yes. um, a, a lot of the teachers were quite young uh, and really engaging. I remember if we did a, a history project, so that he'd take us down to um, to down to the hall, and we'd, we'd raid all the theatre props, and you know we'd be an, in a, an Elizabethan street, all dressed up, and that sort of thing, and then make the move across to Kozal Comprehensive and they're all sort of ancient or mostly mm. ancient features. And it was, okay, come in, read paragraphs, blah, 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 to blah, 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 and answer the questions. Anybody speaks, you're in detention. Oh, and wow. I was like, wow, this is a bit different. So it, it took a bit to adjust, but I, I started in the October of the third year, what was back then when we had a third year, we only went up to year five, didn't we? Um, it's all very different now. I know they talk all these different levels. So yes. it was just at the start of the time when um, of the third year. So I I, um, I bedded in and then we had the two years that we studied for the exams. So embedded in very much into my sport. Um, I had been when I was younger. Uh, both myself and my sister used to swim for Stetchford Swimming Club. And it looked like we were going to go across to Camp Hill Um I was East Birmingham swimming champion for four years running. Wow. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd set a, a national time uh, that was the fastest time for a 10-year-old. Um, and we used to swim. We were in the water seven days a week. And we probably did back at the age of 10 and 11, probably around about 40, 50 miles a week in the water. Whoa. <laughs> But just just loved it. I mean, my sister was so stylish and graceful. She was a breaststroker, but oh, she was poetry in motion. I was just a bull in a china shop and get through the water as quickly as possible. Yes. 
um, so that was a real love. But then I had a shoulder injury. They couldn't work out what it was. Um, sort of left that behind and, and then got into my rugby, which I totally, totally loved. Um, and we played for Washwood, although they were very well known for their soccer. And in fact, just as I left in the third year, the fifth year is when the All England final. So they were very well known for that. But we had a mm. fantastic rugby team. And in the mm. first two years, we only lost one match. So um, when I did go to Kozel, of course, it was this big, oh, look, we've got this superstar rugby player coming. <laughs> uh, little did I know, I'd um, just hurt my back quite badly and, oh. and had a, a fracture just off the main spinal column. And oh. um, yeah, I wasn't a, a kid who used to moan about injuries, but my mum picked up on it and just said, I'm taking you in. There's something wrong. You're not right. And I had a load of x-rays. And then on the last one, they went, ah, there's your fracture. So um, that took a bit of a, a time to heal. Um, and I hated that because I couldn't play rugby. Um, I was told if it moves, you're going to be paralyzed from the neck down and there may not be anything we can do. But but then went on to tell me that all these male gymnasts and all these sports people that I knew the names of at the time had a similar complaint. And they were all doing all these sports at you know Olympic level and this sort of thing. So as a young guy, I ignored it, to be fair, but I was banned from playing rugby until... I think it was in the fifth year. My parents had gone away on holiday. Well, no, it must have been the fourth year, sorry. And uh, we were being looked after by by a, a relative that had moved in. And um, they didn't know. That I went off to play two rugby games. And, oh, boy. And so last time I did that for a while, because when I came back, I actually was paralysed for about two, three hours in the back garden. I mm -hmm. couldn't move at all, just lying on the on the ground. <laughs> wow. Uh, scary at the time, very scary, because you're lying there going, how do you make your body move? How? Yeah. What process do you, you just, it just moves. Um, so when you, you're lying there and you can't do anything at all apart from breathe, it, it really, 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 and really shocked my sister. She was all panicky, but I was more worried that if... <laughs> The regular ambulance that mum and dad will kill me when they get back for playing rugby. So I, eventually I managed to get up off the floor and um, was very sore for a while and didn't play for, for a little while. So, um, yeah, that, that, that was quite a knock, really, because I really enjoyed sort of the sport. But I uh, stayed active in other ways, um, didn't stop me doing everything. And then you sort of finish school, um, what was it, about seven O levels, most of them A grades. Um, and then well, what you do next? Yes. <laughs> so I, I, I didn't really see myself going to university. Back, back then it wasn't a case that everybody went. And I, I, I often found that people I'd met that had been were a bit up themselves and looked down on people. Yeah. And. I didn't think that just because you had an intellect that allowed you to do that. And a, and a lot of them that were really clever seemed quite thick, <laughs> practically. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, gosh, it's showing some of my very narrow beliefs back then. I'm laughing because I can't believe I used to think like that. But um, So I, I did an OND in engineering eventually yes. and got two distinctions and realized I never wanted to be an engineer. It just wasn't my thing. Wish I hadn't done it. Yeah. Uh, and that was at Solely Hall Technical College. Um, and and that, that was good fun for two years. And I did play some rugby for them. Um, so things were, were sort of looking up on that level. And I was doing a, 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 a few Saturday jobs here and there. And then just as I was finishing off college, um, or the year before I finished, I think it was, um, or well, six months before, I, was, I turned 18 in the October and I started to work um, at the Red Lion in Knoll, as, uh, just behind the bar. And at the end of the first night, he asked me if I would become um, sort of head barman <laughs> and offered me uh, a lot more hours. And as things carried on with that, I'd finished college. And just as I finished, I was thinking, what do I do next? I, I don't want to go to university. Mm. I've got to find some work. The assistant managership came up. So I was Ansel's youngest ever assistant manager. Although they wouldn't give me the title to start with because I was still only just 18 sort of thing. Right. Or not, 
Um, but they then allowed me to do reliefs and for, for when the manager was on holiday or reliefs at other pubs. And it was a bit of a dichotomy, really, because, you know, I wasn't old enough as an air to be a manager of a pub, but I could go and do lockups. I could um, go and do reliefs and that sort of thing and, and loved the industry, a real people person. So loved all the fun of that. And, and that's when I set up my first business. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, I used to be in charge when the manager wasn't away, and he taught me really well. Um, and he'd won awards with Ansells, and was one of their, their best managers. Hence, he was at the red line in Knoll. He'd earned his spurs at, at lesser pubs and, and had been upgraded to that one. But he kept control of the catering. Yes. That was still his part of the business. So I took all over, or mostly over that. I mean, Derek was certainly there uh, and doing a lot of stuff. But he let me run with it as much as I wanted to. So I used to meet all the people that wanted to. Uh, I think we could seat 110 people for a sit down um sort of five course meal so we had a lot of weddings because we're right opposite the church so i'd meet a a lot of the people coming in and agree all the terms with them and the one thing i always used to think of was we're hiring in um a dj every time or they bring theirs but we had one that was attached to the pub yes and it just hit me the one day, why am I passing all this business over to somebody when I've got friends that are fantastic with, with the music and had decks and we used to go around and practice. So I had a word with uh, a chap called um, Phil Colley um, and um, we had a chat together and, and then his dad was guarantor for the loan, which was about £1,500, I think, from... I think it was HS, well, it's HSBC, HSBC now in, yes. in Knox. We had to go and see the bank manager and he agreed the loan and we went out and bought all the equipment from, I think it was at Leamington, over in Leamington somewhere, a DJ supply place. And then we kitted it all out and kept adding things to it until in the end we had a really good setup with uh, with all the balls and the lights and the, and the fog machines. And, and then I found that when people came to have a look, I would show them that and say, but that's only if you have the in-house DJ. Yeah. And you get all of this on top. So we started to pick up virtually every two, and then we started to put on events as well. Um, and that worked really well um, for, for, for a while. And then I found I was getting a bit bored um, with, with just running the pub. And one of the clients that used to come in or, or one of the uh, patrons uh, every day brought in a friend, and he happened to be the general manager of what used to be the Trust House 40. Yes. Uh, just Junction seven of the M6, the the strange junction, yeah, and uh, d- chatted away to them, and then two weeks later he came in of a lunchtime, um, and I sort of half recognised his face, and I was like, I know him, I know him, who is he with? And then he came to me, and I said, Oh, he's, he doesn't normally come in until of an, e- an evening, and he said, oh, I've come to see you. Could I have a word? And he wanted me to join the hotel, and even though I didn't have a degree on the graduate course. Mm-hmm. to become a hotel manager. So I quite like the idea of that. Um, Derek was looking to move pubs. He, he sort of had enough of that. So I ended up um, passing the business over to my friend. He took it on full time and he went on and started working in clubs and things. And um, and I moved across to the post house at Great Bar where I started working as a, as a trainee manager. Wow. I mean, Trust House 40... That they, I mean, they don't exist anymore, do they? Uh, no, no, they no, don't. Not, as far as I don't know who took them over or what happened, but I remember they were like, were a brilliant chain and they had like different levels of quality as well. Um, yes. Didn't they? they so, so you kind of could get the kind of middle of the road, but you could get those that were a bit more luxury. And yeah, I remember going up to the Lake District uh, to Oldswater, I think it was. And there was mm. a beautiful place there. It was absolutely amazing. Yeah, incredible hotel chain that was. In fact, that one in Oldswater, they used to uh, send a lot of the trainee chefs there to do part of their training. But the chefs there had some fantastic training. I mean, um, they'd go all around the world with Trust House 40 and go to specialist things. And, and they'd always have to do a stint where they were providing for the royals. Yes. So 
they would fly all over the world to prepare the meals and stuff. And then they would then settle in a hotel and, and start then working their way up. But they had fantastic training. And, and that's where I worked first was, sorry, no, I didn't go into the kitchens first. Sorry, no, I was in the a la carte restaurant. Yeah. So that was learning the silver service and with yes. the, you know, the chimelier and and, uh, and everything else. So, and, and yes, we used to have clients that used to, I mean, there was one chap, I can't remember what he did. And he used to fly in by helicopter every other Friday just for the Dover Soul. <laughs> and they would all buzz around him because he was so important. <laughs> 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 and he used to love going out because he used to have a cigar, but he wouldn't smoke in the actual uh, restaurant, although you could back then, obviously, yes. uh, before the day of, of stopping it all. And I remember being, I'd gone out, uh, I can't remember now, I'd gone out and he was by the side of the car park. Um and I was, I can't remember what I was doing. I was fetching some stuff from another store that we had. And he called me over. Uh, and he was such a down to earth guy. He was chatting away to me. Um, he was into his rugby. Um, I, I, I never lost my love for rugby. In fact, the Rugby World Cup's coming up. But we had this whole conversation. And then when we went back into the, the restaurant, we then had to, uh, you know, take this pose on again. And I remember the restaurant manager almost died when he turned around and said, "See you soon, Neil," and put his thumb up. <laughs> and I went, <laughs> "Oh." See you soon. And after, and he could see him boiling up. And as soon as he'd seen him out, and they all waved him goodbye, and you know, did all the usual bravado around him. He came back in, and he was like, "Don't you ever!" He was the Spanish guy. Don't you ever talk to my clients like that again? And oh, he had this huge for all with me in the kitchen to the point where two of the, two of the managers were having to hold him back. Wow! <laughs> absolutely lost it, and and it it, it it makes me smile to day when you watch all the kitchen programs and how they swear at everybody it it, it was i've worked, <laughs> worked in a lot of places the worst language i have ever heard was in the industrial kitchens effing and jeffing and oh it was <laughs> oh. it was so weird and then you step out of the one door into this you know a la carte restaurant and all of a sudden you know nose in the air and it's all very posh and yes. you know yeah as, as it was then it was, it was it, but it was it was it was it was interesting to learn those new skills and, and sort of understand how, how that all worked. And, and then I got shoved into the kitchens um, and I spent about nine months in the kitchens and it was everything from bottle wash <laughs> um, through to um, working on service um, and even being allowed to cook the steaks. And, and so second in command, so sous chef. Um, but it was fantastic to work with all the these people. I mean, there was a... Um, a West Indian girl that was, I think, called, um, oh, what was her name there? I can't remember, but she trained in France with oh, can, 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 Candice or Candessa or something like that. But she'd worked in France with some of the most amazing sh chocolatiers and, and wow, the stuff that she could bang out and the skills that she had. And I remember we were doing this party and these three, three B2 slabs of chocolate arrived from 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 Switzerland, Sweden, or something, mm. um, and we were told you cannot touch that. That is the creme de la creme chocolate. It, apparently, each slab, even though I'm going back sort of thirty years, each slab had cost something like about four or five hundred pounds. Wow! And they got this big party coming up. Well, of course. People would walk past, just have a little chip it and chip it and chip it, chip it. Oh, it's really nice chocolate. And of course, <laughs> we, so <when> he came <laughs> to actually doing the event, she went absolutely ballistic because there'd been so much taken. She was then having to scrabble around and you know, having to change. It's the worst thing you can do is say to people, don't you dare touch it. Because of course they're going to, basically what you're saying, I dare you to touch it. <laughs> And they had, they had nibbled away in it like mice um, to, to the fact where she had to change the menu and the chef was going mad. But I mean, I saw that head chef um, and it was back in the days when a lot of them used to like a drink and, yeah. and, and, and smoke in the kitchen, believe it or not. Yes. And he picked up one of the biggest knives I've ever seen and threw it at another chef who ducked and he stood back up 
and the, the, the knife would have been implanted in the middle of his chest if he oh, hadn't moved. Oh, my word. And he just went, just grabbed his hand, threw it on the floor, went, that's enough, I've had enough, I'm gone. And the whole kitchen was just totally silent. Mm. And it, bang, it would just start again. <laughs> yes. um, things that you think could never happen, but you watch these programs nowadays and hear the language and the way they speak to each other, and you think in this modern day and age, you're still at work. You shouldn't be speaking to people in that way. No. But uh, it's funny how some, some areas of work still haven't quite cottoned on the fact that you're harassing and bullying people and, yes, and treating no. them really poorly. So, Absolutely, yeah. That's, that's very, very uh, sad, really, that that still goes on in places. Yeah, totally. So you had that. That's to be in kind of hospitality. How many years were you in hospitality for? Um, I suppose with those two, that was about three years, two and a half, three years at that point. Yeah. Um, but I'd always been a people person, so it it it, it didn't feel like work. No. No, oh, well, <laughs> that's good. Work. It certainly was. <laughs> but it's it it is. They do say kind of working in hospitality. Um, you get you get to understand people, um, because it's almost like you've in that story that you explained, the guy that came in the helicopter, the through to the Spanish chef or manager or whatever who was shouting at you. Um, yeah. The you you have you've seen human nature, all the extremes of human nature. And that's what they say about hospitality. You get a real good insight into the human psyche, the human being, and the good and the bad. And, and certainly it sounds like with the stories you're sharing that that happened for you. You're absolutely right, Michael. I mean, the pub gave me a view of it, but the hotel heightened that because of the people that we had in. I mean, we used to have football teams come in mm. and – it sounds really bad, but they were made to eat at seven o'clock and they had to be out of the restaurant by eight and back in their rooms by nine. Mm. And then at 11 o'clock, the manager and the captain of the team, and if I mention the names, they are well-known names. Mm. One of them went on to be an England manager. <laughs> and they would just get ratted, absolutely rat -arsed. Yes. <laughs> And be smoking big cigars and having brandies. I like put the rest of the team in bed, but the captain staggered up to his room. And and yes, you would see different things. We had the whole cast of of Hello or Hello Hello. Yeah, came oh, in. Wow. And it, it was when they were at their height as well. So we were like, wow, everybody's here. Every single person that you've just seen on the television. And you know who the nice people were that day? Go on. The oh. actors. The actors, yeah. all the people that you didn't know were so up themselves yeah. and, and treating you like clicking their fingers and gesticulating with their fingers to you. And you were trying to get past them to do the silver service that's burning your arm off because you've got this huge flat that you're surfing from that's just been on gas burns and burners. You've got maybe six towels over your arm that you can smell are starting to singe and <laughs> that, that mm -hmm. slight burning smell. And there's this one guy would not move. He would not move. And even his colleagues had got to the point they were going, trying to like jam up and go, he's trying to get past you. Can you just, and he just wouldn't and, and sort of pushed his chair further back. And yeah. I'd sort of had enough of it. And I must admit, <laughs> I did touch his head just slightly, mm -hmm. just, just enough for it to burn. <laughs> and he, jumped he was Whoa! and the woman opposite looked at me and smiled and she just had that look on her face to say well done mate <laughs> <laughs> and, and i was a very very you know oh, i'm so sorry so so sorry I'm, I'm my apologies and there was a bit of a hoo-ha about it i did get a telling off afterwards because yeah. you know I, I didn't need to do that but he was <laughs> being such an arrogant obstinate it, it just not a nice but but all the actors all the famous people were really nice yeah incredible uh, and, and really polite and and asking us questions it, it was it was all and it, oh, that seemed to be 
very common. A lot of times that happened where the, the actual famous person was quite nice, but not all the time, I have to add, but they used to, it was the other people, the, the ancillary ones that you didn't know that were sort of, I don't know, perhaps they were jealous of the fame or they wanted that sort of power or to be known, I don't know, but they, they wanted you to know they were important. Um, but yeah, that was I, interesting. I can see that. I, I mean... I don't know if you know anything about the six human needs that Tony Robbins talks about, but yes. th that that kind of human need number three, which is our need for significance. And um, I can well imagine that if you're with, you know, an entourage where there is a famous person, you're going to act up, aren't you, as if you're famous as well? Because, well, that person's famous. I'm with this person, so I can now behave like a famous person and act up a little bit. Mm. So I, I can well imagine that, yeah, it can go to people's heads, but okay, I'm, I'm judging a bit now. Generalisation, I don't want to make generalisations. I'm sure not everybody as, does as I that. Don't want to. Yeah, but it, it seems to be worse back then. I, I, I don't know. I, mm. I, 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 I'm not sure, maybe because we had more cultural airs and graces and 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 those dividing lines, you know, between working class, middle class, upper class, and and all those sorts of things have sort of merged, haven't they, over the years? But yes, we are. Well, I am being generalistic, I must admit. But they were my experiences, and, and it was certainly the way I felt about them yes. and, and saw them, and so did a lot of the other staff. So, but again, yeah, it, it's all part of your getting to know human beings, isn't it? It's seeing all sides of it. So you've had such an amazing insight um into the human condition really <laughs> so amazing and okay so that was hospitality and what and so you did about three years in that you said and, and then i moved into sales um I, i'd sort of um i'd been let down with trust as 40 because the general manager and fair play to him, he, he was from Scotland and he'd been all around the world for years and years. And uh, one of the best Trust House 40 uh, hotels up in Scotland, I can't remember the name of it now, uh, they were looking for a general manager. So it was, I think, five miles from where he'd been born. So he went up there and what was the um, HR manager became the general manager. And um, we just never seemed to get on. And as soon as he left, she treated me like a dog's body and virtually took me off the course. Um, and because I didn't have the degree, I didn't seem to be able to fight being left on it. And he'd gone. So I just thought, I'm, I'm not enjoying this anymore. I'm not going to be able to get to where I would like to get to. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I started off in sales then. And... Um, and with a, a small company selling fax machines. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> that are now in museums. <laughs> now they're in museums, yeah. <laughs> and I, I remember it was a big postal strike happened about eight months after we'd started. Uh, and it was a big one. It went on for about 16 weeks, I think, or, or so. It was a long, it seemed to be a long time back then. I may be exaggerating, but it was, it wasn't a few days. It was weeks and weeks. And, um, it was make hay while the sun shines. It was pull up at the depot, fill your car with fax machines <laughs> and get out onto the road, knock a door. Have you got a fax machine? No. Nope. Do you want one? Yep. Here you go. <laughs> 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 um, but, but at the end of that, none of us had any prospects left. <laughs> <laughs> and there was nobody that wanted a fax machine that needed one because they'd all had to buy them to get over the postal strike. Yeah. So that seemed to be a bit of a dead end. And then I went across to Bowwater Scott, which were a, a division of Andrex, but on the industrial side. And um, and and that was that was very interesting. That I, I likened myself to a racehorse, and they were more shire horses taking orders. But that was very interesting because we had distributors, and we had to build up relationships with those distributors against other distributors that they could do business with to try and get them to promote your products. And yes. I I did really really well with that. Um, and sort of went in and helped train them on our products, go to appointments with them, um, of obviously be able to offer some things that they can't at that point to, to maybe get some business and started to, to sort of pick up big, bigger and bigger clients. And I, I, I couldn't understand the mentality of salespeople that when they got into a big sale would be like, ah, 
oh, panic, panic, panic. And, and I just be like, look, if you can sell one thing, then surely you can sell a thousand of them because it's the same process. <laughs> it's yeah. the same thing. Yeah. It's why are you getting into your head that it's now a thousand of them and it's such a big deal? Um, so enjoyed that. Um, and then from, but I, I didn't fit in there. I, I, I was more of a racehorse, I think. And I, I thought that some of the stuff was a quite draconian and, and took away some of your freedom to be able to be sort of a free spirit to look for new things and a, a lot of paperwork in behind it. So I, again, I got a bit bored and then moved across to a company in telecoms. It used to be called Norton Telecom, who were owned oh, yeah. by Siemens. Yeah. And and loved that uh, for for a while. Um, that 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 was great. And it was when the Peugeot two hundred five one point nine GTI had just been released, and that was the company car. So young guy, flash car, <laughs> love that one. <laughs> yeah. And I did my first million pounds. Oh, well, it was just over a million pound deal there. Uh, which when we used to have to uh, put in mega streams and killer streams for data transfer for companies yes, yes, because you didn't have digital networking. I had done everything with the clients, impressed them, um, and they wanted to come with Norton instead of going with SDX directly, yes. even though they could offer a, a cheaper solution. And then the um, the area manager decided to take me out of the picture, and then they were making some redundancies. I was last in, first out. Right. Uh, he delayed the contract coming through, and he picked up this million of paying contracts and all the commission that goes with it. But, hey, you live and learn. But Whoa. it was nice to have done that in my own early 20s to, to have actually sold something of that value because yeah. that was when a million was quite a lot of money <laughs> oh yeah totally now it's a billion is a lot but a million isn't yeah i know mm. oh wow man but that's you know it really is not i mean again it's more education about human nature isn't it in terms of what people do in organizations and how they're treating colleagues or even colleagues that are going out of the business it's i've seen and it's only got worse hasn't it michael in my eyes as as i've immersed myself further and further into sort of blue chip businesses as we'll find out through through the uh through the interview i suppose also through, through this discussion mm. it's something that for me has just become more and more and more profound and i know a lot of people use the saying it's only business mm. You only do business in a business relationship, and how can you say a relationship is only business? Um, and they seem to think that's a get out of jail free card these days to, to treat people poorly. So, but we'll come into that, I suppose. But yes, it's a real bugbear of mine how how people are treated these days. Well, I I think it's you know, it doesn't matter when when we talk about it as we're as we're there now. It's it's you know it's no problem, big kind of mentioning it because. It is something I, I don't see it so much now because I'm not in that space because I run my own business. I'm, you know, just a few of us working mm -hmm. together. So you don't really get that sense of uh, of what goes on in corporate. But I mean, it's it's you can see some of it in politics, even, you know, in the Gosh. way that people are treating each other inside their own parties. and. You know, I can well imagine that big corporates. I mean, one big corporate recently is is Deutsche Bank, who are making a load of people redundant. Mm -hmm. And part of me says about time, um, but then part of me also feels, you know, rotten for the people that are leaving there. I don't. I don't know if you saw this story um, written up anywhere about Deutsche Bank. As there were, as people were leaving the building, mm -hmm. they had tailors going into the building. In fact, there were photographs going out. They looked like they were carrying their stuff, but they were carrying suit bags, and they were actually taking suits in to fit the senior executives in Deutsche Bank with a cost of fifteen hundred pounds per suit, something like that. And as people were leaving. As people were being made redundant, leaving the building, they were being fitted their executive suits. I mean, that to me says it all. <laughs> it's wrong. It's wrong. 
It's so wrong. I mean, I don't want to be down on business. And I know that in business, you're only in business to make money. But I think the morals and values that, that people hold at that level have been eroded and eroded to the point where all I kept hearing was, it's just money. It's just money. It's just money. Um, and I'm, I've got to be careful some of the things that I say because I'm privy to some very sensitive information mm. uh, with some of these companies. Um, and I know I chatted to some of it about, you know, with yourself, but I, I'm not sure I can put that on air. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, it got to the point where it, it just lay – it just left a, a bad taste in my mouth time and time again that the only thing that, that, that seemed to be discussed is money, 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 money. Um, yeah. And I think there's a lot more to business than just making money, <laughs> yeah. personally. Well, uh, most definitely. And, you know, I think there is a younger generation out there who are demanding something different. You know, they are starting to protest against the adults or big business and govern and big government not having taken any action on climate change. Um, they're only really, really young at the moment, but hopefully those are some of the people for the future who are going to make a change. Uh, and, Gosh, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> I really me hope too. so. There needs to be a change of guard. I mean, I've posted a couple of things over the last sort of forty-eight hours about Borneo. And um, the destruction that's gone on there in just the last 20 years just for this palm oil. Um, and, and no one reports on it. Um, and you have to go digging for this stuff. And, and in the Amazon rainforest, there was a report that's come out by a doctor that said if we just replanted all the trees uh, that, in, that should have been in the Amazon and then planted X amount and more billion. Uh, it's, it's very doable. I mean, I'm talking of billions, that's that's an awful lot of trees. But it's it's very doable when you segment it up to different parts of the world and, you know, look at them as individual projects. And they reckon that if we – I can't remember how many billion trees it was now. If we replanted them, it would reduce the carbon yeah. by two-thirds, by yeah. two-thirds. Yeah. And all we're doing is cutting down – was it – um? it's one and a half football pitches per second or per mi- – sorry, per minute in the Amazon. Mm. One and a half football pitches per 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 minute, and it's I can't get my head around that, mm-hmm. and that's happening day after day, and and you know somebody within these corporations is making the decisions for that to happen, and and that's just a profit. So let's hope the uh, the young guard have a planet to look after. Let's <laughs> I'm saying it all maudling now and all doom and gloom. I, I mean, I, it's good to see that some of the younger people are starting to realise they do have a voice and they can exact some pressure. And if that means that human beings that are going full circle instead of being horrible to each other, they're starting to think about each other again and the planet and what it is to be an animal, not just a species that takes what it wants, and that we are looking to try and have balance again. I think that's, that's something that they... The, if we don't do it, I don't, I, I don't think that the human species will, will carry on. Um, yeah. Yeah. We, we may have technology, but is that worth anything? <clears throat> if the planet's dead. No, <laughs> you know, it, it's worth anything. Bo- it's definitely not worth what? anything at all, no. And and th- there, is a, there is a focus on wealth and finance more so than focus on anything else. And the the reason I say that, there isn't one single country that I know of, that I know of, there might be one, there might be one or two, I don't know, or maybe more, that doesn't focus on GDP growth, right? Mm. So Mm -hmm. whenever you are focusing on something you want more of, that is growth, that is more wealth, generation because that's what you believe is going to solve everybody's problem because everybody Mm. wants to be wealthy and that's the primary goal so the goal isn't the primary goal isn't we need to have you know um improvement in health that's our primary focus no the primary focus for any government is gdp whether they're successful or not you can see that Mm. in the way that donald trump speaks uh, yeah. about you know the stock market and or everything that's happening over there because that's how it's being measured you know the growth of the stock market the gdp growth the company's growth yes. that's what is a measure of success which means that 
because that's where governments focus and that's where businesses focus. That's where human beings are being focused. All the focus is on financial growth, wealth, because that's what they believe is going to make everybody happy. Yeah, and as we all know, money doesn't truly make you happy. Nope. And there's how many multimillionaires, how many billionaires have got to the point where they've they've given up work and 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 almost committing suicide yep. <laughs> within a year because they're so bored or or they've made that final sale and then they sit there and then they think, well, what else is there? Or yep. What else is there to do now? Or they try to then regain their health that they've lost because they've worked, you know, hundred hour weeks and flown all over the the world and. You know, pro- probably got a divorce or two in there somewhere, and yep. and children, and and all of a sudden they finish and they think, well, what have I actually achieved? Yes, I've been in this wonderful position and ha- weren't all this money, but am I healthy? Do I have much to offer people? Have I broken lives along the way? So I, I, yeah, I, I love people that that want to make something of themselves. Don't get me wrong, um, and and uh, you know, business can be cutthroat at times, but I think if you go in with some good morals and values. You can often get eaten alive these days because yes. some of the things I've seen people do, I'm just I just didn't see it coming. Mm-hmm. Um, but okay, yeah, so as you say, you live and learn. <laughs> yeah, this is it. We're always learning, Neil. Always learning. Right. So we, the last role was telecoms. You you got made redundant. You were first in, first out. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and and from there, I, I was sort of looking around and I think because the family had always sort of seen or, or thought that I'd almost wasted the education a little bit. I wouldn't say I was the black sheep of the family because I hadn't done anything to be a black sheep, but I always felt that um, they expected more. Yeah. So with my grandfather having been a drill sergeant major in the Scots Guards and then was uh, an inspector in the police, um, and I'd been brought up with the law, and as I say, my, my stepfather, a class as my father, is is a solicitor, then I thought, right, I'll join the police. Right. <laughs> and and I, I, it was an, an interesting move. I, I loved the job. I'll be very careful in what I say about it, but I, I ended up leaving after five and a half years, and I, I suffered PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, right. after a particular tra- uh, an attack that happened. Um, and some people will say that's your hero story and all the rest of it, but for me, the hero story was really understanding what stress was and depression and anxiety. Um and then having to overcome that because it was attacking me. And as a man, we have to know what it is and fight back. And and I was left um, very, very ill, very ill and very psychologically sort of damaged whilst I was going through that process yeah. to the point where, I, as I said to you, I, I tried to check out. And I am so thankful that um, that, that didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, somebody, yeah. I, I, Somebody came home a bit earlier than expected, and and yeah, I was still just about to. So it wasn't a case of I was pretending. I, yeah, as a policeman, you know how to do things if you want to do them properly. I won't say how to do certain things in case other people pick up on it, but yes. there's certain things you can do that they can't reverse. Mm. So um, yeah, but and at the time I was totally, totally, totally distraught and. Um, yeah, it was it was a harsh time, uh, and then there were some other things that went on and uh, take you down further. But the fantastic thing was, I I had all this help thrown at me because I was a police officer, and mm. almost feel guilty because I know most people would never get the help or support that I had, and for that I am totally totally grateful. Yeah. Um, h- h- hundreds of hours of counselling, um, convalescent home, um, that the the there's. There's two, I think there's one down in London and there's there's one in Gorin in Kent and I went to that one. Um, The Queen Mother used to own the property in 16 acres of this amazing grounds and I went there. It was better than a deluxe hotel. It was absolutely astonishing and then the medical care and the support that you received there was phenomenal. Mm. I remember there was a room there was a room there and if all you could do is blink, you could live in that room. (laughs) 
Yeah, yeah. So if you're completely paraplegic and all you can do is blink, you could actually get yourself up out of bed and get a shower. And oh, it's, and, and the quality of, of service was, was second to none. And yeah. I had to do like a management course and relaxation classes. And, and slowly, 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 I started to, to turn that around and get a bit more control back and, and to the point where I tried to go back, uh, obviously, into a position. But that wasn't working for me. And shortly after that, then, then I left. Um, and, um, and that's when I, I did a couple of jobs that I'd done previously, cause I forgot to say I'd been a bailiff as well, but, and I know you'll say, what, you forgot to be a bailiff. <laughs> that's a really interesting <laughs> one, but yeah, lots of stories, but you're the ones that you could probably imagine standoffs and, and people getting aggro with you. But, um, yeah, the, the, the main story I suppose was, was the fact that I then went to retrain and I retrained as an aromatherapist, a reflexology. Uh, counselor um nutrition and exercise was just something that came naturally to me because of all the stuff i'd done with the sort of rugby and, and weight training and and, and staying fit and and, and med- meditation um which which shocked everybody because i'd been an 18 stone muscle bound um man's man didn't believe in emotions got to be mm. big and strong never show any fear and, and then i'm doing aromatherapy massage <laughs> so, <laughs> Brilliant. I so, love it. And I'd never been happier. I'd never been happier. And very shortly after qualifying, I became the therapist for what used to be the Worcester PCT. And I was treating the staff out of different hospitals and then brought other therapists in. And, and that was how I then started to immerse myself and have done over the last 20 years within stress and stress management, HR, occupational health, managing first day sickness absence, health and well-being. Um, but the special consultancy for me was was in the stress management and that was when I, I met a chap called Roger Edwards who was my business partner in my um, a company called Morpheus Personal Development and we specialized in doing the organizational stress risk assessments yes. um, when the health and safety executive suddenly said well stress has to be as important as, as any physical ailment yeah um, and we spent seven years at that, and we picked up some rather large clients uh, because a lot of the people that were being made to do it were public sector. So we picked up, uh, you know, we did work with Birmingham Council, um, even though they employed three people internally to do the same job yes. when they heard that it was us. Uh, and we we gained the contract with the West Midlands Local Governments Association to be the sole supplier into those councils within the West Mids. And we were on the HSC websites. We were delivering at all different shows. Um, I was on stage with Dame Carol Black, yeah. uh, the Minister for, for Health and Wellbeing, the one who brought in the five portions of fruit and veggies. She's a lovely, lovely, lovely lady and very, very committed to in, in making the, the overall health of, of, of British people um, a lot better. But yes. it certainly just took the whole light off stress. And because what the stress audits did was give you a – management style and culture analysis, management uh, cultural analysis of the organization, their companies didn't like what they were finding. And because it's a risk assessment, if there were issues and you scored below what the HSC HSC had set as as benchmarks in the, the different categories, then having done a risk assessment by law, you have to do something about it. Of course. So, it was becoming challenging, but it was challenging in the right way as far as I was concerned. And we were doing some great work. I mean, the, the last job we did for, for Birmingham Council was one of the directorates and um, uh, amazing return on investments, um, uh, probably well within the sort of 50 to 1 <laughs> ratio uh, return for every if, – if not, if not, probably more like 100 or – yeah. It's I, that's difficult to measure, more, isn't it? I mean <laughs> – it is sometimes, but when you reduce somebody's retention from 38% down to 20 in yeah. six months yeah. <laughs> and they employ over 7,500 people in that directorate, mm. that's a lot of money each year and the training and everything else. So it was very rewarding. I, I learned a lot, um, worked a, an awful lot with, with a lot of large companies within the UK in almost every sector that you can think of. 
Um, but as I say, Dame Carol Black brought in the um, health and well-being, and it was all about eating your fruit and veg. And it, everybody just dropped off the face of the earth. Nobody wanted to do a stress risk oh, assessment. Oh, wow. Um, and we took the decision to close the business at that point, which was really hard after putting sort of seven years of your life into it and, and getting yourselves up there to be seen as as, – as... well, we we – it's hard to say at times, but we, we were leading the way. Um, yeah, of course. We, we, we took the competency framework that Birmingham uh, Birmingham had and transposed that onto the competencies that the HSC had put together so that when we did the audit, it was talking about behaviours rather than an answer to a question that was a yes or a no or a, you know, disliked or something. So the real discernible thing from that at the end of it was if we needed to bring any interventions in, you could easily write the training course because you knew what actions they wanted to change or behaviours needed to change. Yeah. So it was very, very, very targeted. And we were the first company to do that. There was another lady that was working on it, but uh, at that point she hadn't brought hers to market. So it was a shame that it, it just all fell apart. And and I must admit, I was going through a bit of a, a breakup, a, a serious relationship. I wasn't really doing too well um, just after that. And um, But I did secure a, a, a position with one of the clients that we were providing services into at the time and was brought in with them to prove to the board there was a book of business in HR services and occupational health. Yeah. And... Worked with them for a while, um, was promised, or rather certain things were discussed and dangled. And then again, at the end of that, once I'd proved to the board, um, <laughs> I was sideways ousted and because they'd stupid across directors from the companies that just bought out and then they had an occupational health department. So again, it was like, oh, for God, how did I not see that coming? Yeah. But um, yeah, you, yeah, you live and learn. And then I had a period of unemployment. Um, which was quite hard and got rid of most of my savings. And and then I started to work within managing sickness, absence and occupational health again with a very large uh, risk averse. In fact, they were the largest risk averse company in the country at the time. And um, again, <laughs> standing start, doing really well, making loads of sales. Uh, and then they up your target because of one thing. They, they, they wanted a full book of business so they could sell the business and um, sacked all the salesmen and everything else. So you got very low overheads, full order books, sell the business for a load, but you're out the door again. So I, at that point, with everything that had happened, I just sort of had enough of it and, and thought, right, I'm just going to go and do – an everyday job, uh, a normal everyday job. So I started working as, as um, a night driver for, uh, for a company in Redditch, uh, delivering windscreens, and did that for about seven or eight months. Um, then I went and did food haulage for another one and, and did a few jobs like that. And then I, a friend of mine who's a tree surgeon, um, he asked me um, if I could go and help him out for a bit. I did sort of 18, 18 months or so with him, which amazed me with my arthritis and everything else. And the working outside and being fit and having done the van jobs, all of a sudden the arthritis wasn't the same issue that it had been 10 years previously. Mm. Which was, but I'd been out. I'd been working again. I'd got my body moving again instead of either sitting in a car or sitting behind a desk in front of a computer. And yeah. it was amazing to see that I'd, I'd sort of um, got to that point where the body was responding again. And as I say, I'd been out of sort of corporate world, I suppose, for sort of four or five years. And just before, well, not just before Christmas, but middle part of last year, I decided I was going to do something more than this because, in all reality, I was bored. Um, there's still a brain in there working away. <laughs> yes, I can get up at four o'clock in the morning and, and work a 16 hour day and, you know, move three, four ton of, of wood. But um, the brain still wanted to do something. And after a lot of heartfelt searching, that's when I decided that the happiest time I'd been was working with people with stress and stress-related conditions as a therapist and a counsellor. But I, I, I wanted to do more. So I've spent almost a year now, and I'm just about to launch, um, putting my ideas together that I've sort of gleaned over the last 20 odd years. And I'm going to be working in the field of, of stress management again and have a real vision to 
reduce the suicide numbers in this country of men. It's absolutely shocking at the moment, Michael. I know mm. we were chatting about it. You know, 12 men a day at the moment, 84 a week, uh, are killing themselves. It's the biggest killer of males under 50 in this country. Um, and it's uh, it's one of the highest increase of men over 45 as well. So there's been some massive changes in the 20 years since I had my breakdown and try to check out. And and yet we still see on telly, oh, isn't it wonderful um, that somebody can talk about stress? Well, they can't still because more and more men are killing themselves. And I've made it a, a, a mission of mine um, to make a dent in that. So I've brought the 20 years experience together to bring an offering to the table, but I'm going to work as a, a transformational coach, life coach, um, with different offerings which we can chat about if you want to. But yes, please. Yeah, definitely. Let us know what what specifically <laughs> you're doing. <clears throat> we want we want to hear it. I mean, it's brilliant, and and I am I'm, I'm sitting here kind of um, air applauding you so that we're not making a applauding noise on the podcast. But fantastic, and and it's desperately needed. Desperately needed. I mean, the, the, there has been somebody I tried to get on the podcast, uh, but it didn't work out in the end, a South African guy who mm. um, worked for, U I think it's Unilever, um, uh -huh. you know, very senior HR uh, guy, and he uh, suffered with stress. And he oh. tried to check out, and he, appear he appeared on the one show, actually, and I, I somehow managed to record the clip on the one show for him. I didn't know him. Um, and yeah, and he's out there speaking about, you know, the kind of mental health and the need for people to, to sit up and be aware. And, and you're right. I've got firsthand experience of young boys who are struggling, um, yeah. we, in this, you know, without going into the detail, but, um, it's not just. You know, when you say under fifty, it's every age group under fifty that is that has issues in the kind of the male side, and the, there is a lot, and there's a lot to be done there. So the 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 job you're setting up for is it's going to be massive. It's going to be a massive need there. It is, and it, 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 a bit of it is is knowing where to start. And I think for me, in the last couple of weeks, having seen some of the information about the police officers um, being attacked, I think somebody said that seventy five percent of all officers will be attacked in in, in a twelve month period, or, oh. or suffer an attack. Um, I didn't catch the whole of the article, so I wasn't sure if it was just one particular force or as a whole. Mm. And when you see something like 75%, uh, I, I mean, I know the culture's changed. I know we live in different times. And, you know, the only constant thing in life is change. So we we should celebrate it. But how have we lost in, in just 20 years the culture that it's 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 not okay to, to attack police officers mm. and that it's now okay to do that. But, yeah. hey, we could get into that one for the next 10 hours or so. Yes, so yes, we I could. think one of the things that I will be looking at is trying to get in and help some of the forces. And I've got some great people around me as well. I mean, my business, uh, my partner, sorry, not business partner, my partner, Mandy Gutzel, who has a company called No Limits, which is K-N-O-W and then Limits, has been working with mental health for, for over 30 years. And there's some other colleagues and we're, we're getting our heads together um, later on this month to look if we can put something together, maybe as a pilot um, but I really want there to be differences within what we do. So some of them are traditional coaches, whereas as I'm, I'm one of these, <laughs> I won't say a new age coach because that sounds terrible, but I will work outside with all of my clients. It's called talk and walk. So that's exactly what we do. We're not sitting in a room facing each other, staring each other down and those 10 minutes of silence and you don't know what to do with yourself and stuff that I experienced. Um, and so, 
it's the benefits that nature brings to the party. I mean, it, it, it hits you on a physiological and psychological level. There are chemical things and reactions that happen just by walking outside or walking at a methodical pace. And I won't bore everybody with the science, but that's a helping hand if somebody's suffering with anxiety or, or, or the depression side of things or the panic attacks. And it just helps quieten them down so that perhaps they can hear some of the words because a lot of people have busy minds and when they have the busy minds and they're up in their heads, they, they don't have the room or the capacity. The glass is full. You can't get anything else in there. So for me, having researched and all the stuff over the last 20 years, I wanted to be – so I'm likely to get shut down for this, but um, I, I even as a counsellor, I called it friendly ear service. And I needed to do more for them because for me, having been affected by stress and depression and anxiety, and, and as I say, it's the point where I wanted to check out, it was – it was mind, body, and emotions, your MBE, that it attacks. So if you just see a counsellor, that may be the psychological side, but who do you go to see for the physical and the emotional, although the counsellor could be the emotional as well, but it it becomes very hard to keep sorting all these different things. So for me, it's bringing all that together and working as a coach. You don't have to go backwards to go forwards. So we don't have to relive all of the psychological unrest and, and disturbance that you had because when you go back, you just open up that can of worms and they feel, they really feel all of that stuff again. And, and that affects their physiology. And I wanted to make sure that I could help them move forward, but with their mind, body and emotions in balance. So for me, I bring all of the expertise. I'm not just a coach who just does coaching. I look at the mind, the body, the emotions. I also talk about the six pillars. And these are the six things that if you have in place and you, you look after them can, can not only give you um, a resilience to suffering from stress, it helps you recover from stress. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about making sure that um, – that you you take the time out to look after yourself. So mm -hmm. making sure that your your sleeping patterns are good or as good as they can be. I know the stuff on the telly last night about sleeping disorders, and that was one of the most common ailments when we did the audits because we'd ask them about the personal side of life as well. We do a health and well being part of the stress audit, and we'd gleam all this information about what people were doing. And the sleeping disorder was the one most common issue that people had but um bringing laughter back into your day every day having something that makes your belly laugh raising your levels of activity um i remember at my worst i i had six days just sitting rocking in a chair going mad <laughs> with no sleep for, yeah. for five nights having hallucinations um that were as real as, as me sitting here talking to you now on the phone yes um so uh, it's, it's, I was going to say, so so having that activity to get you back up out of the chair, making sure that your diet gets back on track. I mean, all these things are, are part of the pillars that, that help people be, get a gain a baseline again and start start to, to get some resemblance of control. So having a look at that and then the emotional side, you know, for myself, it was um, a lot of voices and, and those voices when they talk to us are thoughts. And my belief is that you can only have an emotion if you have a thought. Yeah. Um, so why am I feeling so awful? What are the thoughts attached to that? How often they are coming? Are you listening to, you know, what I found, Michael, was people don't even hear those voices anymore, even though they are there. Mm. They don't hear that damning, you're useless, you're rubbish, you're never any good, you're you're a waste of space on this planet. You, you know, you should just stop yourself and, and take it out. You're, you're no good to anybody. Yeah. Your family would be better off without you. You're, 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 worth, you're worth less than a pile of poo. Uh, and, and I could use an adjective after adjective and, and express and express, and people that have been there will understand what I'm saying, but they get to the point where they don't even hear those voices because they're so used to it. But those voices drive those emotions. So there's a lot of work to be done there with people. So so for me, it's looking at them as a totality and, and then working with them outside in nature. Um, 
and looking to try and bring balance back to those areas for them through walking and talking to them. Yeah. And I find that having been a sufferer, you have an empathy and a connection with people that you don't get just from reading a book. And I'm, I'm not having a go at people that haven't suffered that work in this industry. It's just that I've seen a lot of bookworms who haven't got a clue what this is. And they just read and spout stuff out. They, they haven't had the experience. And it, 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 it stops people coming forward because they have a bad experience or they don't think they're going to be listened to. Or how can I explain those emotions when I don't have words for them? Mm. But when, when you've been a sufferer, sometimes you just need to look at somebody's eyes, for me, and you can see the pain they're in. Yeah. And sometimes it's just a body language or a sigh at the right time and you know exactly where they're coming from and there's a connection that that's that's tangible it's real you you can feel it and it helps them gain trust in you that you you're a dark sider like them you've been to a darker side and you've come through so that gives them some hope as well and it's about being present with somebody and feeling them, feeling the emotion behind the words that they use. Yeah. It's, it's not about just listening to the words. It's, it's, it, you really have to feel them. So I, I just love the fact that I'm just about to launch all of this and there's going to be lots of different products within there. Um, I'm going to do meditative breathing techniques for people, guided meditation, half days, full days. But I'm still going to have the business arm as well. So we're looking at business training or business coaching. But I may use my colleagues and associates for that because – they often want to just, uh, uh, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, they want to achieve a, a business goal, whereas mine will be centered around people with suffering with stress and stress-related conditions. And that's my passion. That's what made me happy. Mm. That's what gave me that spring out, out of bed every day was when I got to help people. Yeah. So I, I, I'm really, really excited. Um, a so little bit scared, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. So tell me, how is this going to be delivered? What What's the format for delivery? Is this, you know, individuals, one-to-one? -one? Is this group, workshop, classes? in companies what what will it look like the stuff for me at the moment is getting back to working with people as individuals um i've spoken to numerous numerous organizations in and around the country now for quite a while to find out if any of these men's action groups are actually working and there's only one that i know of that has set up in london that's actually getting some traction the rest are falling by the wayside because men are just not attending. And I know why, because before I got diagnosed and even after being diagnosed, it was on about my, my sixth session with the counselor. Mm. And I had this amazing blow up at him to the point where, and this is hard to say because the chap had worked into some of the most um, prolific mental institutes in the country with criminals. And this guy saved my life. And years afterwards, I bumped into him. <clears throat> and he said he'd never been as scared as the day when I threatened to oh, yeah, destroy him. Mm. How can you know what I'm going through? You're not a man. Look at you, you skinny little thing with your threadbare cardigan and your do-gooder attitude. You're not a man. You're not big and strong and have no fear. And oh, but, and to hear this years on that he thought that if he said the wrong thing at that point, that I'd have snapped him like a twig. And he feared for his life more than any other point in, in the time that he'd worked with in mental health. Um, and it, oh, that destroyed me to think that this man had saved my life and I made him feel like that. But um, it still gets me nervous, you can probably hear. But he did save me, and he was an amazing chap. Um, but all these things add up to the fact that you can. None of us are broken totally. There's a great belief now in psychology that the only mental health disorder is stress. The rest are all biologically driven with maybe chemical imbalances, uh, sorry, imbalances or, or biological defaults, and that stress is the only mental health disorder. 
And I went from somebody who believed if you suffered with mental health, you just needed to weak minded fools. I would never suffer. Um, I remember as a child, I mean, the cruel things you would say. We used to have the coaches with the children with 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 special needs, and you used to call them window lickers. I mean, how flipping cruel was that? And you'd take the mickey out of them as they drove by. And I can't believe I was that sort of a person. But I suppose you get caught up with other people. And now, I, nobody is broken. Everybody has the ability to gain good mental health. Yeah, and. So many people now, one in four that are working, are suffering from a mental health disorder. And a lot of the time, there's no help for them out there. That I went around every one of my local GPs, and none of them offer any psychological treatment anymore. No. And they've got this other system set up. But then the clients ring them, and then they're not accepted. So then they get back into this loop, and they're not getting any help. So... For me, it's getting help out there for men. And if I can let them understand, I was one of those uh, hairy ass, men's men, big, strong, no emotion. You know, you you wrestle with a crocodile because you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you'll, you'll just stand your ground against anybody, you know, a policeman, a bailiff, a doorman. Mm. It's always been that strength. But for me, the real strength of a man is the compassion and love that they can hold for other people and 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 that's what i learned when i went through that because i was able to rebuild myself so for me it, it's been a 20-year journey i've had some ups and downs um i feel sorry for some of the work colleagues at times especially in the police that had to put up with me back then but i didn't know i was losing my mind um God, I mean, I, I think I told you, Michael, didn't I? And I think it shocked you. At, at the age of 30, I was still on duty and suffering. And I wrote my name on a prisoner in custody sheet. And I stood there or sat there for 20 minutes deliberating, have I spelt my own name correctly? <laughs> and I couldn't make a decision. So I said, I'll leave it and I'll come back to it later. A 30-year-old in uniform working as a police officer, and I couldn't even have the confidence to know I'd spelt my own name correctly. That's incredible. And that's how you can hide it. And it made me smile today. I know I'm jumping around. Sorry, Michael. Um, there was no. Jeremy Vine with us today, and there was a, a police officer who'd been done, oh, sorry, been taking cocaine all the time. He was in the police force, and he's out of it now. And he was talking about it and, and talking about drug addiction in the police and how he managed to hide it, and nobody knew um, that he was doing it. And I was like, yeah, you can. You can hide. My parents didn't know I was ill. Nobody. I was hiding it because of the shame. And what I want to get across to men is – there isn't a shame. This is an illness. The same as you can break your back or, you know, <laughs> cut yourself. You can get a cold. You can get a virus. You can get MS. You can get all. It, it's an illness. It's a real to God illness. And just thinking that you can think your way out of it as a man because you're big and strong. That's what almost killed me. Yeah. So if I can get the message across to men that there's some people working in this industry that know what it is to be like that, hopefully that may encourage some of them to step forward. Because what I found, Michael, was when I went back on shift, there were guys that were seen as the big guys in the station were coming to find me out and breaking down in tears while I was having to hug them because yeah. they didn't know who to speak to or what to do. And because I was going through it, they would come to me. And I was just saying, I'm still not right. I'm still far from right. I can't help you, but you need to tell us. I ain't telling anyone. No, well, if you can't help me, I'm out of here. Poof, gone. Yeah. And you're like, whoa, you've just seen and spoken to me, but – you're gone. And it's it's the macho rubbish that we still carry. And I can't believe with all the culture change we've had, it's still prevalent in the young guys these days. You can't say, you can't say because you're weak then. And the weak people, you're not weak when you suffer with stress at the level that you suffer it as I did. It's not because you fell over at the first hurdle. It's because you went to the point of self-destruction until you couldn't give anymore. Mm. And I would not accept I was suffering mental health. I say that succession, I had that. And from that point on, I 
had the realization and the epiphany that I, I'm, I'm suffering a mental health disorder. I can't hide from it anymore. I've got to be honest and open. It's the only way I'll overcome it is to be honest. Like an alcoholic admitting they're an alcoholic. They can only overcome it once they admit they're an alcoholic. So, but yeah, if there's one thing I can leave for people, it's, it's that they're not broken, that, that there are different things that you can do and, and never give up hope and, and speak to somebody. It doesn't matter who it is. Um, you know, a stranger in the park or somebody in the, the bus queue. I, I don't know. Um, this is the speak. problem, though, because um, I think you've just hit the nail on the head. They don't want to speak to anybody either. Um, it's because they're scared. I was scared. I was mm. scared that I was this mental nutter and I'm never going to come back. I was going to be a window licker. Who would take me seriously in life after that? Mm. And yet I was I was one of the top consultants in the country for managing stress and stress-related conditions whilst we did the stress audits. Yeah. So you can. There's an absolute true life to be had. And if you can turn those negatives into a positive you can understand how stress attacked you with the physical science the emotional science understand where those weaknesses are and yeah. and that can give you flags and in future as you overcome it you can keep an eye on those and keep an eye on your health and well-being but until you start opening up all you're going to do is hold it in as a pressure cooker as, as we discussed and, and the lid will blow and because and i i was Mm. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, and and there has to be also a level of recognition at some stage, right, of the individual recognizing that that's where they are. They're in this, yes. you know, never they're in this hamster wheel, not be not able to resolve it, not able yes. to do it themselves, and I, I think a lot of the time. I mean, I'm not an expert in this, but I have seen that people are in denial or they're not in denial. They kind of know, but they don't want to take responsibility for it or they don't want to kind of go, oh, yeah, I recognize this in me, but I, I can't speak about it. <laughs> And yes, and, 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 and you know those conversations that you have in your own minds, and and you 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 you're asking yourself, are you going you're going mad, Neil? You are going. This is not you. Why why can't you make a decision? And again, it's back to those voices and the constant voices, and then how how loud is the volume in behind that? What's the emotion in behind that? And then you learn later on that that's like talking to your core program as a seven year old, and to be real. The, the the voice was not just shouting, it was screaming with all this venom and 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 crap that you throw at yourself that you, you're drowning it and and you can't see the woods for the trees and you keep going and you keep because you don't want to admit. So I agree with you, Michael. Yeah, you just don't want to admit mm. that you're becoming mentally ill. It's it's this stigma that you're never ever going to lose, that no one will ever employ you again, no one will ever see you as a serious person again. So there go all your aspirations, and you know back then perhaps that was the case. Perhaps it's different now. I don't know, but I've still see it in organisations. Oh, oh yeah, but they suffered stress, didn't they? So mm, perhaps we, can they really cope with that? And I'm I'm so much stronger than I ever was before. I was weak before. Now I have emotion and know what it is and 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 can can happily accept that I'm a man of emotion. Yeah. It's made me a much stronger man than I ever was before. And it's allowed that compassion to come out even further that I've always had of a human being. So it just makes you more of a rounded man. And any man that says that they're not in touch with their emotional side is is missing what it is to be a whole man, as far as I'm concerned. But yeah. That's maybe another discussion. <laughs> yeah. The, oh God, man. There's there there is so much in that. Um, have you come across Lewis Howes? Um, that name rings a bell, but you okay. know what I'm like. Well, he's knows. an American guy. He used to be a big strapping. Well, he still is a big strapping lad, but he used to be a football player, and he got an injury, and his whole world just collapsed, and ah. he suffered with stress and anxiety and breakdown or whatever, and he built himself back up. I don't know how he did that. I don't know all of his story. But he wrote a book a couple of, not that long ago, a couple of years ago, and it's called The Mask of Masculinity. 
I um, haven't. I've heard of that book, but I've never read it, Michael. Well, it might be a good one. Um, and and it talks about. I haven't read it either. Okay, but I <laughs> heard him speak about it, and and this is this is what happens. Men wear masks, right? They yes. have different masks for different situations, and so the the main mask is. I'm a man and I'm strong, you know, I'm not weak yeah. and I'm not going to come across as weak or, you know, vulnerable. It's that vulnerability. And then Brene Brown talks about, you know, vulnerability um, mm -hmm. in a massive way and kind of exposes all of her shortcomings as a, as a human being, um, let alone as a woman, uh, being a human being on this planet, etc. So there, there are some amazing role models out there now that are starting to speak up about vulnerability, yeah. about the masks that we carry around. And yeah, it's, it's somehow, for, for me, what comes up, what I see is, wow, wouldn't it be cool if there was somewhere either online or on an app where men could reach out and just share how they're feeling anonymously and and you know get some advice of what to do next type of thing um just allowing them to talk michael i mean that first step just allowing them to be able to say something i mean my website will be out next week and everything is treated with utmost confidentiality and i suddenly wouldn't put a post up that somebody had sent through but no. i'm hoping that starts to become a portal for people to be able to just even just reach out, make a comment. Um, Brilliant. It, it, as soon as you start talking, you start to make a, a move in the right direction. That's the thing, isn't it? It's and it's how I think the key thing is how to get them to start talking. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, that one, I think there's a lot of people <laughs> same, a lot more eminent than myself that would, would struggle to answer that one. Um, I think we have to look at school. We have to look at core programming. We have to look at what it is to be a man in today's society. Um, and that's changing all the time, especially as different cultures and things are all merging together. I think men are a little bit lost at the moment. I mean, it's great that women have girl power and women power and let's celebrate all of that. But let's not dumb down the man. Let's not just jump all over the man and tread on him. He's in a bad enough place as it is. Mm -hmm. So they're a bit lost, you know. It, it, and it, it's so funny, isn't it? I mean, it, the things that have changed, you watch programs like, well, I don't know that I watch it, but like Loose Women, and a guy comes on, they all ogle and talk sexually about him. And I'm sitting there thinking, hold on, that, that's, that's, you can't do that. Because <laughs> yeah, if a guy did that, you'd be shot dead. You'd be this, this misogynistic. You'd be, so what? I understand that the power has been weighted towards the man for centuries, but they want equality not to emasculate emasculate us and i think a lot of men are unsure of what it is to be a man these days but as i say that's an area which is interesting it's interesting um i may touch on that later on in life i don't know but for me at the moment it's getting that lifeline out there for the men that are out there that that do you know if just one person hears this michael and, and makes contact not even with me but with somebody else for help then it's totally worth it absolutely worth it um and if I can become a figurehead or a, I mean, we all have missions and values and, and goals, don't we, when we set our businesses up and, and, and mine are to within five years be seen nationally as, as, as a figure that's made a difference and brought this down. And I'm going to try and move heaven, heaven and earth. And if anybody listening to this has got any ideas or they're looking for a project to put money, in, money into, do you know what? Get in touch because it's not about making money for me. It's about making a difference. Yes, earning a living is fine, but I'd, I'm not one of these new coaches that's going to have all this stuff up to make all this money. It, 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 I really, really, really want to make a difference yeah, I know. within I know. stress management. And, and, and do you know what? If I make some money off the back of it, then that's great. But that that is not my driver. And, and you know, business people will shoot me down for that and say I'm an idiot and you'll never make anything if you've got that attitude. Well, I believe I will. 
because people came to me before when I was a therapist and they, they got a lot from it and and made a massive positive impact in people's lives. You try and do that in the corporate field and it falls a bit foul. But I'm back in the game. Um, my passion is there and I'm really looking forward to, to what I can achieve moving forward. Brilliant. It sounds amazing. And thank you for sharing so openly and honestly about your journey into all of this. And, you know, I, I, I've become known um, by my friends and family to say that for, you know, challenges that we come across in our life, I call them gifts. And yes. we, we don't know that they are gifts until we're out of it and we can look back on it. And certainly Absolutely. what you've been through at some level was a gift for you because Absolutely. there is no way that you would have the empathy, the understanding, the knowledge without not having gone through it yourself. Um <laughs> Yeah, you're absolutely, and I say to people, it's the worst thing I ever went through, and I would not wish it on my worst worst enemy. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't wish any other human being to go through it because it, it almost. I, 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 I could talk about my, my beliefs in a different way of why I, I, I know now I didn't do it at that point because but it's going to take too long. So, yeah, sure. for me, it's it's it really is a case of. That was a gift, um, and it was the best thing that happened to me in a lot of ways because it gave me this drive, it gave me this passion, it gave me this desire to not just overcome the illness but then make a difference in people's lives. So, yes, it is a massive gift. I yeah. agree with you. Brilliant. So so next week the website's going to be up, or very soon, probably by the time people listen to this, it will be up. Um, so tell us what it's going to be called. It's called Talk. And walk. So we talk with an N in the middle with the two hyphens or whatever they are, and then walk. So talk and walk. Um, I'm going to have a Facebook page, which will be talk and walk as well. And my LinkedIn page, which is just Neil Wood at the moment. Um, I'm not sure if I'll change that or, or whatever, but I'll be on LinkedIn and and then looking to to work with the marketeers to make sure Instagram and all the other things are sort of all tied in. So hopefully looking for a launch next week. And um, I can certainly pass the details over so that you can update your, your records on that, please, Michael. Yeah, brilliant. So what is it, talkandwalk.com.co.uk? Sorry, .co.uk. Yes, yeah. it is, yeah, just .co.uk. Um, and, um, yeah, as I say, it'll be there. Please take a look. There'll be some videos on there. It'll have a, a listing of, of the different offerings with a bit of an explanation uh, of what each one's about. Um, for the business side of things, it's all totally bespoke. It, it's not a case of just getting a course out the cupboard and going, yes, we have one here. It will be tailored to the needs of the individual uh, requirements of each client for the business side of things. And as I say, I will work with some known associates. Yeah. Um, but for me, the main thing is to talk and walk and um, a natural approach to coaching outside. Each session is an hour and a half on its own. Um, and I offer some discounts because obviously people booking for sort of multiple sessions. Yes. Um, coach, coaching isn't usually that good as a one hot, one hit. So um, like like counselling and everything else, you can't achieve everything with somebody in one hit. It's ridiculous to do so. And mm. a lot of the people are are receiving their gift, Michael, <laughs> that I'm going to be doing. Um, they, they need more time. So there's going to be discounts for group book. Uh, sorry. Um, booking sort of six sessions uh, up front and that sort of thing. And I'll use meditation and some of the other techniques, the breathing techniques and, and maybe massage and, and some of the things that I've got, depending on the client, depending on their needs, um, possibly within the walk as well. So, um, and they can be just your sort of local park or you can want to go a little bit further afield. I'm doing half day and full day excursions with me as well. But it's, it's all one-to-one -one with me to start with. Great, great. That sounds amazing. I I am there on the sidelines cheering you on. <laughs> <laughs> go, Neil, go. This is a brilliant project. Um, I wish you all the success in the world with this. And That's very kind. I can definitely um, help you a little bit, perhaps to, to put you in touch 
with a few people as well. And maybe we can do that uh, after after we've been on this this interview. Um, I will send you some names so I can connect you with some other people. Um, and also, Thank you. that's very kind. And also, there's a there's a great kind of channel. Um, a friend who in America has conversations with men about um, kind of embracing embracing all of the things that we've just talked about as well. So, if you're interested to to have a chat with her at some stage, anyway. But I'll send those uh, to you. you afterwards as well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your kind of vulnerability and honesty. Uh, very, very refreshing. And <laughs> um, and I know we'll see each other at some networking event in the future again very soon. Thanks, Neil. That's, thank you, Michael. Take care. Take care. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Stay alive, you can. Share your story.